Good evening and welcome to my Gresham College lecture, which is coming to you from this beautiful space of LSO St. Luke's in London. My name is Xenia Pestova Bennett. I am a concert pianist, I'm a university lecturer, and also a musician's well being uh, advocate. But tonight I'm going to play and talk about a very different instrument the magnetic resonator piano, or MRP for short. So this instrument takes something that we all know and love, the regular piano, and transforms it, augmenting it completely beyond what the piano would normally be capable of, creating what we can call a stunning hybrid cyborg instrument. So however, before I unveil this magical beast that's just sitting next to me, I'd like to look at the history of invention and innovation in keyboard instruments, and also talk a little bit about pushing the boundaries of existing instruments. I would also like to mention the importance of collaboration between composers, performers, instrument designers, and ultimately audiences as well. And we will then move on to some demonstrations of the instrument and performances. So just to talk a little bit about this background, throughout the ages, we know that composers and performers worked together with instrument designers, with instrument makers, pushing instruments beyond what they were capable of in order to create something much better. And since the dawn of musical expression, humans explored new sounds and searched for a bigger pitch range, bigger, greater dynamic range, more power, more speed, demanding more from instruments. And you might be familiar with anecdotes of Beethoven breaking strings and shattering keys, demanding power that the instruments of the time were simply not capable of. So without forward-looking musicians and designers, we wouldn't have the instruments that we know and love and love to listen to and play today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the evolution of the piano in a nutshell, as it were. You might, of course, already be familiar with the predecessor of the piano, the harpsichord. And this instrument was, of course, very different from what uh, we might expect from the piano today. Strings were plucked by little quills that were controlled from the keyboard. Uh, this is unlike wooden hammers striking strings in a piano. So very different sound. And what this meant is that the instrument couldn't actually change levels of loudness like the piano can. So in very basic terms, no matter how much energy the performer might put into depressing the key, the volume level would just remain the same. If we look back uh, over the history of keyboard evolution, we learn that Bartolomeo Cristofori di Francesco is credited with inventing the piano, or what came to be known as the piano. As a musical instrument innovator, Cristofori improved existing keyboard design and also invented several new instruments. From the early 1700s, he worked on what eventually would come to be known as the piano. Clavicembalo col piano e forte, uh, a keyboard or harpsichord that can play both soft and loud, which was capable of a much greater volume range than the harpsichord. Still, Cristofori's instruments are very much removed from the modern grand piano and many radical innovations followed uh, later on. So these include the addition of the cast iron frame, uh, the child of the industrial revolution, which enabled us to have more power, and uh, also the introduction of the double escapement action, a very interesting development by Sébastien Erard, which was patented in 1821. And double escapement action allows faster repetition and greater sensitivity of the key. We could say that the most recent hardware upgrade uh, can be dated back to the invention of the middle pedal on the piano or the so-called sostenuto pedal, which was 
in the 1840s, so actually quite a while ago. Uh, so the subsequent patenting of this by Steinway and Sons was a little bit controversial. According to some sources, uh, appropriation might be a, a better word in this case. And this mechanism allows for selective release of certain notes while others can remain dry. So some notes resonate, others not. Very, very interesting innovation. However, the question that we might ask today, the question for composers, performers, instrument makers working today is what next, what next? Has the concert grand piano simply stopped evolving? Is this it? We've reached the pinnacle of evolution. So it's kind of a, a museum piece frozen in time. And the answer is apparently not, which is really interesting and exciting. Numerous weird and wonderful attempts to enhance what the piano is capable of have been made and continue to be made, of course, uh, including several very interesting innovations in the past decade or so. Just to mention a few, and of course, this is by no means uh, a complete list, but these include a microtonally fluid piano that can be retuned and can be used to play classical Indian music invented by Jeff Smith or the parallel string piano that explores a greater tone variety designed by Daniel Barenboim or for example the so-called inside out piano which allows easier access to the strings that can be plucked and used for extended techniques while also playing the keys designed by pianist improviser and composer Sarah Nichols. Of course, the question that we have to ask is whether these innovations will stand the test of time. And we know that history is full of neglected musical inventions that unfortunately we've never heard of, just waiting forlorn behind museum glass somewhere, similar to the instruments pictured on my slide right now. So I've already mentioned the importance of collaboration between composers, performers and instrument makers to push instruments to the next level. And of course, audiences form the next key link in that chain, in that relationship. In fact, composer Dmitry Kabalevsky gave the audience equal standing with composers and performers. He said that without audiences, music would simply not exist. So sadly, the instruments pictured in my slide right now simply didn't have enough composers writing for them, performers playing them, or audiences listening to them. Today's lecture focuses on a different instrument, another innovative instrument. Uh, but this instrument seems to be doing quite well in terms of composers, performers, and audiences. The Magnetic Resonator Piano, or MRP for short, has a promising future. There are now several of these instruments in existence. They reside in a range of countries on different continents across the globe. The MRP was designed by composer and researcher Andrew McPherson, who is now at Queen Mary University in London. And the process of design of the MRP dates back to around 2009. So it's been around for a while and continues to be improved. The list of pieces that were written specifically for the MRP numbers something like 30 contemporary classical competitions to date, as well as pop and jazz recordings released commercially, and also a major commercial film score, Christopher Robin, uh, with music by composer John Bryan. Audiences love the MRP, and Normally, the instrument draws a crowd around it after every performance. So I'm only very sorry that tonight you don't have the option to see it, hear it and touch it uh, in the flesh. But hopefully we'll have the option to do this another time soon. One question that some of you might have at this point is why would we want to add anything to the piano in the first place? And to help answer this, we need to look at the wider context and history of experimentation with uh, this instrument over the last hundred years or so. 
So while the piano, of course, is a beautiful instrument, it's a very versatile instrument, and I have to say this as a pianist, of course, it's my first love. At the same time, we have to admit that it comes with its own set of limitations, like any instrument. One of the most characteristic qualities that we instinctively associate with piano sound is the principle of attack and decay. So once a key is struck or played, sound just dies away. It gradually disappears and there's absolutely nothing that we can do to stop it. So no matter how hard I might try as a performer, it's inevitable. Unlike a wind instrument player who continues to shape sound with their breath or a string instrument player who can uh, apply pressure and continue activating the string with the bow, pianists really have very little control over resonance uh, in terms of whether it dies away or not. It dies away no matter what you do. We can of course shape the resonance by adding pedal and so on. We can't however make sound grow louder without repeating the key again or playing something else. And we also have no control over other expressive qualities of sound, uh, such as, for example, vibrato that other instrumentalists have. Even though some pianists do kind of wriggle their, key, their fingers on the key suggestively when playing a, a really uh, sensitive lyrical melody, but this is purely for show, by the way. Another limitation is the rigid tuning of the piano. We know that we're kind of stuck in equal temperament with equidistant tones repeating themselves over and over again. And we can say arguably this means that the instrument lacks the expressive immediacy of, again, other instruments such as other string instruments, which can do pitch bands or sweeping glissandi connecting several notes, or even bring out different partials or components of the harmonic spectrum. Pianos are sadly incapable of such expressive devices. Innovative musicians have found different ways to get around some of these limitations over the years. And this is of course a vast topic and could be a whole other lecture. So I'll mention very briefly some composers including Henry Cowell, John Cage, George Crumb, Anael Lockwood and many more have expanded the relatively limited color of the piano through so-called extended techniques. So these techniques include ways of playing beyond the keyboard and might involve inserting objects in between the strings to change the sound or using mallets or other objects to activate resonances, as well as plucking and strumming strings inside the piano instead of relying on the keys and hammers to produce sounds. Experiments with literally bowing the strings of the piano using violin bow hairs or fishing line attempted to bridge this gap between the decaying and sustained sound. And while this sounds really beautiful and ethereal, it can be quite a complicated technique. If you're using violin bow, you have to use rosin on the hairs, which can crumble and go inside the piano. Uh, or you might get tangled fishing line if you're using that. So not necessarily ideal. You can see here, I have a little picture of myself bowing a string on the piano and audience members looking on. And it's, it's uh, quite faint, but there's a little bit of violin hair tied to one string. So quite a beautiful and interesting sound, but complicated to set up. Inventions and gadgets such as the Ebo, which is a tiny little magnet that I have here, have also been used to produce sustained sound on the piano. And this is originally designed for use with electric guitars, but can also work on piano strings or any metal strings. The magnet is placed on the string and the string is set in motion. It vibrates uh, as long as the pedal is down or the relevant damper is released so that the string is free to speak. However, all of these techniques and approaches require learning and developing new skills, a new language almost for the performer, and are not necessarily intuitive. So this is something interesting. 
In the case of e-bows, for instance, there's obviously a limit as to how many you can place on the piano strings and wield at once in one go. The MRP allows us to bypass many of the limitations of the piano that I mentioned through using existing skills of the pianist. So we're using existing gestural vocabulary. We're activating sounds directly from the keyboard. We don't have to go and reach inside or place anything in there. The MRP mechanism is portable. It fits into two suitcases and can be installed and very rapidly uninstalled on any grand piano without any damage to the instrument. So as you will see in a moment when I go to the instrument, electromagnets are suspended above the strings of a regular grand piano. And they're safely mounted on external supports, which means that there's no physical contact directly with the strings or any of the mechanisms, so very safe. The magnets are controlled from a keyboard scanner. So there's an infrared sensor that's mounted above the keys. It senses continuous key position and communicates to the magnets via a computer. And while this sounds very complex, and of course it is, the computer never takes center stage. So this is quite important. It operates quietly in the background and all of the sounds we hear are purely acoustic. There is no electronic sound manipulation. There's no synthesis. So it's very important to remember this is not a synthesizer. This is just a regular piano doing what it does best, resonating. So let's take a closer look. My discovery of this instrument uh, came in a very direct, very tactile way. So I, as I said earlier, I think it's very, very important for composers to work with instruments and instrumentalists to create music that is safe and comfortable to play and doesn't hurt the performer or the instrument in any way. So as a performer myself, I approached the MRP with uh, no preconceptions. I wanted to really play with sounds like a child would play with different toys, just discovering each sound in turn and looking at it in detail. It was really important for me to be open-minded and discover what the instrument can do without any expectations. To start with, I took existing text scores by composers Pauline Oliveros and Alvin Lussier. So these are pieces written originally for the piano, but they're not prescriptive and there is a text that the, the performer has to realize. Uh, one of the pieces is relevant. It's Alvin Lussier's Music for Piano with Magnetic Strings from 1995. And in this piece, the original piece, actually asks the pianist to use multiple e -bows, so the little gadgets that I showed you earlier. Um, however, I made a transcription for MRP, which meant that I could activate all of these sounds directly from the keyboard, made it much easier for me to play. I went on to create little studies or etudes that document sounds that I had discovered uh, so that I can replicate or control them. So I'm going to demonstrate some sounds for you now and then we'll see how they fit together in pieces that I made. So you can see a little summary on my next slide as well in terms of what I discovered. The first obvious feature of the MRP is the ability of the instrument to keep singing, to sustain the tone. So unlike the usual attack and decay of the piano, the sound gradually dies away. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I keep pushing or trying to be expressive, uh, the MRP is able to hold sound as long as I keep the note down. And I can keep going. And I can keep going. So as long as I keep the key down, if I like, it, can, it, will, it will keep resonating or until the magnet melts from the effort, but we won't be testing this particular uh, effect tonight. So as well as indulging in this continued resonance, 
I can also make the volume rise and fall at will. And this can be, again, on a single note or a collection of notes. In addition to using these ghostly resonances of the magnets, the MRP also allows the performer to keep the use of the original piano action or combine it with the magnets or switch between them at will. So this means that I can do really interesting kind of energy resonance transfer effects. And I call this resonance takeover. For example, I can start with a regular attack and once the sound starts to decay, and I think, well, maybe I'd like to keep it going. I can grow into the magnetic resonance. It's really beautiful. So I went on playing around like a child, discovering different toys, pulling them out from the box one by one. And the next thing I discovered was that I can combine several high-pitched frequencies, which allows me to create uh, what I called a harmonic wiggle shimmer. This is a highly technical term that I invented. Um, so this allows me to experiment with really unusual timbres and colors. And I, I explored this in my piece, Radium. If I repeatedly depress or tickle a single key, then it sweeps through the whole harmonic spectrum. So uh, all the little components of a single sound, they're all activated uh, one at a time, similar to what bowed string instruments can do. And this is a really beautiful effect. I explore it in my piece plutonium and I developed what I call harmonic trills. So I'm just going to show you this. As you can see, it's a very subtle uh, finger movement. favorite effects on the instrument. If I hold down a key and then play a key that's adjacent to it, I can create a very magical effect that uh, sounds like a pitch bend. So this is something that would really not be possible normally on a piano at all, physically impossible. So it's really special. So what I'm required to do physically here is uh, really no different from anything that, that we do at the piano normally. So it doesn't require learning a particular movement or technique. It's very natural. And I explore this in my piece, Actinium. 
So all of the effects that I showed up until now are built into the instrument. However, as I continued playing around with sounds in, in these childlike ways, I also was able to follow in the great experimental tradition of the last three centuries or so and uh, push the instrument a little bit beyond what it is capable of. So while I didn't break strings or shatter magnets as Beethoven might have done, I discovered a, an unintentional byproduct. So this is a very interesting, very unpredictable sound, something that takes a while to set up, doesn't really always behave itself, uh, hard to control, but sounds absolutely amazing. And I call it a stutter effect. I explore it in my piece Radon. So let's see if it behaves itself and if we can uh, make it speak for us. So you can hear the kind of irregular patterns that appear and again this is not an intentional feature of the instrument but I think it's so fascinating to discover something new like that and then run with it. So discovering these sounds led me to uh, incorporate them into a series of semi-improvised pieces and I followed on again in this tradition of text scores so uh, while the time line and structure are more or less fixed. Uh, the performer has freedom to make adjustments depending on how the instrument is behaving, be depending on the resonances of the space and how intently the audience are listening as well. So uh, I didn't use conventional notation but I used verbal notation to describe what is going on as well as some occasional notated pitch and rhythm cells or fragments. So as you may have already guessed, my titles have a radioactive con connection and the final results of my exploration ended up uh, being grouped in two sets of pieces. There's glowing radioactive elements from 2018, which is for MRP alone. And there's atomic legacies from 2019 for MRP and string quartet, which I recorded with Ligeti Quartet. Tonight I'd like to share with you four pieces from the first set, Glowing Radioactive Elements. And you can always listen to complete recordings, if you like, on Diatribe Records. So each piece is uh, associated with a color combination. So while I don't experience synesthesia myself, which is a condition that famously manifested for composers including Alexander Scriabin or Olivier Messiaen, uh, enabling them to see colors and shapes when hearing sounds and vice versa. Uh, I don't really have that, but at the same time, the sounds and textures I discovered on this instrument somehow had visual correspondences for me. So I would be very interested to hear, I'd love to hear about your experiences in our virtual Q&A session, whether you could imagine seeing colors, shapes or textures when you heard the music. So do let me know. And spoiler alerts, for me, the colors are as follows. The first piece that I will play is radium, which glows pale blue. I will then continue with plutonium, which glows a deep red color. I'll move on to radon. This is a gas, which is yellow at its freezing point and orange red below freezing. And then, uh, Lastly, I will finish with actinium, which is silvery white, glowing with a pale blue light. And the word actinium comes from the Greek actinos, beam or ray. 
So I will move on to the performances of these pieces.
Thank you very much. So we're coming to the end of our time together this evening. We've looked at the history of the piano and instrument development. We discovered adventurous new sounds and explored ways to extend what the piano is capable of through an innovative instrument, the Magnetic Resonator Piano or MRP. All instruments, including the piano, will continue evolving. Just like music itself, they can be thought of as living and breathing organisms. They, they need to keep growing and extending what they're capable of. And in fact, instruments are nothing but museum pieces without innovative designers, composers, performers and audiences. We're all working together to create unique musical experiences and contribute to musical evolution. So thank you very much for playing your part and for joining me this evening. <laughs>